Welcome to Transforming Human Consciousness. I am Kevan Gaola, your host, and this program is sponsored by the Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Claremont. Baha'is believe that education in the principle of the oneness of humanity is the shortest route out of poverty and prejudice. That the fundamental solution to racial and ethnic conflict rests ultimately on the common recognition of the oneness of the humankind. We believe that America's peace, prosperity, and even her standing in the international community depend on healing the wounds of racism and building a society in which people of diverse background can live as one family. That no serious attempt to set human affairs a right to achieve world peace can ignore religion. We believe that materialistic ideals have failed to satisfy the needs of mankind. And it is time for an honest acknowledgement that a fresh effort now must be made to find the solutions to the agonizing problems of our families, our communities, and our planet. The goal of this program is to appeal to the individual American because the transformation of a whole nation ultimately depends on the initiative and change of character of the individual who compose it. To help us accomplish this goal, we offer the example of the Baha'i community, which has accumulated more than a century of experience in creating models of unity. We hope to draw on the talents, ideas, and accomplishments of people of all ages, cultures, religions, and races who have something to say and offer towards the goal of harmony, cooperation, healing, and oneness of the human family. Through our efforts and with the assistance of the Inside Cable TV, we hope to demonstrate to the community that the day of the unification of the entire human race has come, and to empower and encourage each and every one to join us in releasing the potentialities inherent in the noble station of humankind. Welcome, Dr. Bell. It is so good to have you here as my guest. You. Knowing that you have been involved for many, many years in the educational field, in really transforming many, many lives of students uh, in our community. As a retired uh, Cal Poly administrator, uh, emeritus professor in Cal Poly, and um, having so many involvements in the community. My question is, where are we going with the present situation? What gives you uh, inspiration? What helps you to go on with the work that you're doing, um, with the growth, with the transformation, with the changes that you like to see happen in our community? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> well, uh, I think the thing that that keeps me going is the same thing that's always kept me going. Mm. Uh, as a minority person born and brought up in this country, uh, there are kind of only two ways to go. You either have the hope and the commitment and the will and desire mm -hmm. to move ahead, or else you... Uh, you just sort of get left by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And um, I came from a, I was brought up primarily in a single family unit, mm -hmm. single parent family, actually. And I had a very strong mother. I mm -hmm. still have a very strong mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of her strengths was to make sure that we set goals for ourselves mm -hmm. and work hard to accomplish those goals, my brothers and myself. Mm -hmm. And um, when you do that, especially from a child on, mm -hmm. you get you have a commitment. You get a commitment that you you can't 
you can't ignore. Mm -hmm. um, I, in your prologue there, you mentioned something about individuals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you see, and that's, that's primary mm -hmm. because um, um, I think in this country, in order for us to reach some of those um, standards that you've mentioned there, <clears throat> until, until people really, as a part of their own individual commitment, mm -hmm. can be as free and easy with people of all different colors and cultures and religions as they are, for example, with um, saying saying grace before they eat, mm -hmm. or saying prayers before they go to sleep at night, mm -hmm. or you know, those are the kind of indi you ha you have those individual commitments that you do on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. You almost do them without thinking, mm -hmm. and so when people in this country can get to that level of self commitment mm -hmm. in terms of multiculturalism in, in terms of seeing people not by skin color but simply seeing them as people mm -hmm. then I think that plateau you're talking about you know will be somewhere near getting to that but um, that's the thing that sort of drives me I could no more stop wanting to make this a better society mm -hmm. primarily because I've seen and experienced a lot of the bad sides of this society, mm -hmm. I could no more stop doing that just because I retired than I could combing my hair in the morning or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a part of me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I think that's what we have to have mm -hmm. on the part of other people. How 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 was it growing up for you? And has it changed for mm, the young people? Um, especially of African American background today as they're growing? Is it the difference? There's a difference? It's kind of interesting, Kayvon, because it has changed, yet it has stayed the same How is to that? some extent. Uh, now, the example I like to give is that as an African American, mm -hmm. uh, and I think my example is probably reflects other minority groups in this country, but you know. My ancestors came over here as slaves. Mm -hmm. So for, for that period of time when we were slaves, then you can imagine how things were. Mm -hmm. Everybody who knows anything about this country knows how slavery was. Then along came the Emancipation Proclamation, which said there'll be no more slavery, mm -hmm. right? So if you, if you imagine that slavery was like a huge tree sitting in a, on a plane someplace, and somebody says, this tree is bad, the fruit mm -hmm. of this tree is bad, mm -hmm. let's cut it down. Mm -hmm. So what they do then is they come and they cut the tree down, so there's no more slavery vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis -vis the Emancipation Proclamation. Mm -hmm. But when you cut a tree down, if you don't cut the, if you don't take the roots out, right. You've still got something growing there. Right. So in this country, when slavery disappeared, in its place, because the roots were never clearly taken out, right. came segregation. Right. So segregation then... And the roots were in the hearts and the minds of the... Of the, of the people of who the perpetuated, people. Right. right. So here comes then, years later, another, almost another 100 years later, mm -hmm. comes the civil rights laws of 1962, 63, 64, mm -hmm. during that period of time, the Kennedy-Johnson era. Um, so the actual segregation itself, you know, the white-only signs in the South and all that sort of thing, yeah. that disappears. The appearance. The appearance, but in place of it right. comes prejudice right. that is much more subtle, mm -hmm. uh, but to some extent, just as deadly. Right. And so we don't have slavery, we don't have segregation per se, mm -hmm. but we have prejudice and we have mm -hmm. de facto sort of things that go on that means some of the things still have not changed. And you can go to some places 
in the south and to some ghettos in the north and in the east, and you will see that something simply had not changed, mm -hmm. even though they're on the outside, uh, there appears to be. So when, when you were growing up, if it was in a tangible form that you could see it and recognize it and perhaps avoid it or deal with it, right now for the youth who are growing, it is uh, transparent or it is uh, kind of hidden. That's right. And it is not tangible. That's right. And it, it's, it's, it's very interesting because I grew up in the North and it, it was always in the North the way it is today. It was not like that in the South. But in the North, there were restaurants that I could not eat in. There were, uh, you know, there were places I could not go. But there were never any signs saying no blacks allowed or no Negroes allowed or anything like that. So you really had to feel your way around. When I was 18 years old and I went into the military and I had to go to North Carolina for training mm -hmm. in the Marine Corps, it was very clear. Mm -hmm. There were signs all over the place. I knew exactly where I could go and where I couldn't go mm -hmm. and what I could do and what I couldn't do. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an easier way. We're going to take a short break and then we'll be back and I would like to continue. This is really enlightening and fascinating. I'm really hoping that this would help um, a lot of our audience to connect to the heart of what's going on amongst us. Sure. So um, let's take a short break and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to Transforming Human Consciousness. I am Kayvon Geola, your host, and my guest, distinguished guest today is Dr. Jim Bell retired Cal Poly administrator and we are talking about how was when how was it when you were growing up how is it different for the youth African American youth especially who are growing up now and you were talking about um, how obvious it was then and now how subtle it is um, yes it's uh, <clears throat> If you're talking about uh, social kinds of things, mm -hmm. um, there have been a lot of changes, mm -hmm. but but segregation and discrimination and prejudice against African Americans against other people basically has not changed that much. Mm -hmm. It just has taken a different form. I see. Uh, it was pretty much out in the open. Mm -hmm. I can recall when I was in elementary school um, in a pretty much all white neighborhood mm -hmm. and I can remember very clearly getting in a fight coming home from school every time we had history we studied history mm -hmm. could be in the fifth sixth seventh grade or something like that but anytime we studied history and studied slavery there would be all these comments and remarks and things and I would always get in a fight on the way home mm -hmm. Or any time we studied geography and we studied Africa, there would always be comments about cannibals or, mm. you know, or, you know, I, and I'd get in fights on the way home. Mm. It was always in the open. Um, today, it's, it's more subtle, mm -hmm. except for those people. There's, it seems to me there's a kind of a passive hatred mm -hmm. or passive dislike and an active dislike. Mm -hmm. The act of dislike and the, the, the act of actively learning to dislike now manifests itself with skinheads, KKK, mm -hmm. I mean, with those hate groups mm -hmm. who don't mind mm -hmm. letting you know publicly that this is how they feel. Mm -hmm. But then there's all that passive discriminatory teaching. There's all that passive kind of teaching that goes on where children from very small ages learn that there are differences, mm -hmm. negative kinds of differences between them and people of other cultures, mm -hmm. particularly white kids. Mm -hmm. And that's done, you know, in the movies, it's done with stereotyping, it's done with sometimes just family conversations at the dinner table, it's done in all different kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. I give you a very quick example of what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, here is a young man, well, here's a family. 
the um, typical nuclear family, white family, with the mother, father, and two children. And the, the father goes off to work, the mother stays home and takes care of the kids. He comes home from work one evening, and they're sitting at the dinner table, and he says, I noticed that the for sale sign down the block has mm -hmm. been removed. Has somebody moved in? Mm -hmm. And the wife says, yes, a nice Hispanic family moved in. Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh. And then uh, a little bit, you know, a little bit later mm -hmm. in the, during the course of the meal, so, you know, and he doesn't say this with any bitterness, any hatred at all. He simply says, well, now we've got a problem because, you know, I always wanted to move out to Diamond Bar. We, this house was getting a little too small for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was thinking about selling this house. Now, I don't know if we're going to get the same amount of money for it if the Hispanic family has moved in down there. Now, here's a seven-year-old kid and a six-year-old or mm -hmm. five-year-old kid. And they don't, he, this, this gentleman has never said anything about those Hispanics are bad or don't mm -hmm. play with them or any of that. Mm -hmm. All he mm -hmm. has said is, um, maybe this is going to be a problem for mm -hmm. us because, mm -hmm. because now I don't know if I can get the same amount of money for this house when That's we right. sell it. That's right. And the seven-year-old hears that. That kind of conversation, as a matter of fact, uh, I saw some statistics once that indicated that most of the hate crimes committed by 15 to 19 year old kids, um, young men, uh, when they were asked why they, they didn't belong to the skinheads, they didn't belong to any organized hate group, they were your everyday next door neighbor kind of kids mm -hmm. who, and we can just take my example a little further, maybe a year or two later, that Hispanic family's house is vandalized. Yeah. And they come to find out that it's this young man in this particular family. Yeah. And when they question him, because the mother and the father are shocked, why did you do that? Who made you do that? Mm -hmm. He says, well, I thought, I thought you would approve. Yeah. Because in his mind, when he was seven or eight or nine years old, that family down there was somehow negatively impacting on his yeah. family and his yeah. father's family, yeah. just on the basis of that yeah. little conversation mm -hmm that to all intents and purposes was not supposed to be. That's the passive kind of mm -hmm. teaching of or learning mm -hmm. of uh, negativism toward races that, that happens most often and, that, and can be most effective in terms of how people themselves make commitments to themselves. Mm -hmm. So subtle as it is, so um, inward as it is, how as a community, as families, because I know you're involved in multicultural education throughout the communities in Claremont, all over the area. How, as schools, as parents, as communities, we are going to fight with this hidden um, menace, which is hidden monster, which is crawling all over the place? The only, you can't, it's very difficult to fight by yourself. As a parent, all the out-of-the-home forces, when I was growing up, the basic outside-the-family force was your peers. I mean, your, the kids that you went to school with and hung out with. Today, there are so many more of those. There's television. Mm -hmm. there, are the, there are films. There, uh, there are the peer groups. There are, there are all kinds, there are gangs. There are all kinds of things that go on now that makes it very difficult for you as a parent to clearly control your child's activity. So mm -hmm. many times he's not. Now you can do that and you have to, to some extent you have to do that. Mm -hmm. But everybody else has to help. Mm -hmm. The churches have to help. Mm -hmm. Television does have to help. Mm -hmm. The movies have to help. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's amazing. I was watching TV the other night and I saw it was a 10 o'clock show. But the term B-I-T-C-H was just thrown out as if it was nothing. This was a network show. This wasn't even a, a cable. This was a network show. Mm -hmm. And my only, the only thing I can figure is that by coming on at 10 o'clock at night, they figure the kids are not, you know, kids are not up watching it. Mm -hmm. But there are so many places where if in the natural way there was some, the, the programs and the different things, Let's take commercials. Mm -hmm. We broke for commercial a few minutes mm -hmm. ago, but it's so easy for minority people to watch commercials and identify with commercials where they can see people of their own kind. Mm -hmm. 
And if there was simply more of that, mm -hmm. then it would be so much easier for children and for adults to take multiculturalism as a natural, everyday kind of thing mm -hmm. instead of something special or something you have to learn to do, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. So um, if it happens, it's going to have to be someone used President Clinton, for example, as he said that he worked so hard. They looked at how he did the NAFTA thing. Mm -hmm. He had such a hill to climb to get that thing passed. But he put himself into it 100%. Mm -hmm. The United States, in all of its different venues and in all of its different areas, mm -hmm. communication, I mean, just all the things, would have to put itself into overcoming what has been, you know, developing and growing and increasing mm -hmm. over 300 years. Mm -hmm. It's racism. It's mm -hmm. ridiculous that we can go to the moon, we can do all the things that we do as a nation and we can't simply overcome mm -hmm. color in it, you know, right. I mean, yeah. it, it's so, it, it's ridiculous. So if everybody gets into it and, and everything is done that can be done, then it'll change over a period of time. But uh, do, do you see that changing to the time where we are going to be really able to be one does that seem like feasible or possible? Is that? Well, I know you don't want to hear this, but I don't think it's going to be in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. It's it's because there are still people. First of all, just that concept alone, mm -hmm. that everybody ought to get on the multicultural bandwagon. Mm -hmm. That is difficult to, you know, for people to accept, mm -hmm. uh, and for them to even accept it and then do something about it, is like, you know, it's like having Congress. Mm -hmm get something that some kind of a bill and then have them all agree yes mm -hmm. you, the nafta thing showed so clearly that there were there were legislators who came out and said well i know nafta is good for the country but i'm not sure it's good for me i mean i want to get elected i want to reelect it and i want i have to do what my constituents say so even though they're there to represent right. Right. the country so, and that's the way it would be with this other whole thing. I, I was very shocked once I, I heard the, the very famous Judge Bork was, um, I was really shocked. He said that um, racism you know, was an issue before, but now we are making it an issue. Do you think we are really making it to be an issue? Yes. Are, are we really? Yes, I think it's much more an issue now. It was a reality. It's always been a reality, mm -hmm. but it's more of an issue now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's there are a number of reasons for that. Mm -hmm. Racism really became an issue mm -hmm. when you consider that uh, the two Kennedys, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, the people who really didn't want racism to exist in this country were all just just right. killed. I mean, right. so that brought about a kind of a backlash that made that definitely made it an issue. Let's hope, let's hope that we would see the glimpse and the silver lining in, in your lifetime, in my lifetime. I hope so. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being You're my guest. Welcome. I really appreciate you coming. And um, thank you so much for be being with us. And uh, we shall see you in the following program.